We don't have to stay much longer. It's okay. No, it's not. I've seen how they've been treating you. I'm, I'm so sorry. Why are you sorry? They're the ones treating me like a trophy wife. And I am nobody's trophy. They're just jealous. Well, maybe we should tell them I make more money than you. <laughs> Only because you brokered the Prudential Plaza deal. <laughs> Even so. <laughs> Jill, I am sorry about today. I mean, it's, it's really not about you. It feels like it's about me. This is about me. Steven, not everything in the world is about you. <laughs> Careful. I've ruined people for saying less. Oh, bring it on, babe. <laughs> Jill, this really is about me. The family isn't giving you a fair chance because apparently I don't play by their rules. Say, hey, this really is a magnificent house, Stephen. Your, your parents were clearly yeah. very successful. Oh, yeah. This place is Dad's crowning achievement. Oh, <laughs> speaking of your father, he wants to see us. What? Well, I overheard him tell Peggy to come and find us. Oh, great. Can this day get any better? Stephen, come on. It's his birthday. Let's just go see what he wants. And then we'll drop off Andrew and Charlotte at home, and you and I can go out to dinner. We could bring them with. Oh, I, I, I don't know. I have to take this. Oh. All right, I'll be back in a little bit, and then we'll go see what my father wants. Okay. What's up? Hey, Uncle Edward. Yeah? Uh, don't mind him. When he's on a business call, Nobody else exists. And you're okay with that? What do you mean? Uncle Steven gets so focused on his work, he doesn't seem like he has time for anything else. Oh, no. Actually, Steven might be the sweetest man on Earth. <laughs> Uncle Steven? I'm beginning to think I'm the only one who sees him that way. I mean, I love him, but Uncle Steven's reputation is more shark than sweet. <laughs> His children would agree with you. Oh, I should not have said that. This has not been easy on you, has it? I just don't understand. I've been bending over backwards, trying to get those kids to like me. You know, I know they're never going to see me as their mother. But... Father. I am determined to make this work, but I'm in over my head here. Let it out. Thank you. I'm, I'm as tough as nails. No, really, I am. It just, it just feels like I've gone from being a newlywed to being in a war zone. <laughs> and I, I just don't understand any of this. <laughs> How much has Stephen explained to you about the family? Evidently, not as much as he should have. You know, he didn't even want to come today. Hmm. But I wanted to meet all of you in the worst way. And apparently, you have. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, I guess I just don't understand the dynamics of a big family. I thought our marriage would be a happy surprise. Oh, you come from a small family. Only child. My mom died while I was an undergrad, and my dad shortly after I graduated from Harvard Law. Harvard Law? I heard you were a commercial real estate broker. Oh, I am. Wow, you're not an astronaut too, are you? 
Hmm. Only in my spare time. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm still learning everyone's names. And you changed clothes, didn't you? Baby spit up on me. Ooh. What are you gonna do? Uh, okay, so that means you're Taylor. No. Mm. Taylor's one of Peggy's daughters. I'm Haley, Leanne's daughter. Leanne, okay. Leanne is the twin of Tom, mm -hmm. who died. Oh, is that why your mom drinks? One of her reasons, and her relationship with my father. Does your father drink too? When he's not in jail, yeah. I'm sorry, I should not have asked. Well, you won't know if you don't ask. That must have been a really tough way to grow up. It's still hard, well, sometimes. You know, I'm just not used to this level of intensity in relationships. Mm. Well, at least I wasn't until I moved in with Steven and the kids. And you know, today's been no picnic either. I'd hope to make friends with Steven's sisters, but... Your family now. They'll come around. They're a bit taken aback that Steven actually got married again. Okay. How often does your family get together? The last time the whole family got together was Grandpa's 85th. But some of us go to church together, and Christine and I are best friends. We help each other survive our mothers. Okay, Leanne and Melinda. Ooh, I've heard stories. <laughs> Most of them are true. They've been BFF since they were 10 years old. You know, Stephen says he doesn't get along with some of the people in this family because, well, how did he put it? Oh yeah, he doesn't play by the family's rules. That's probably true too. Most families have rules. Some are spoken and others just understood. There are those you can break and those you don't dare. So what rules doesn't Stephen play by? Well, that depends on which sister you're talking to. Oh, this is getting complicated. Could I get a cheat sheet? The short and sweet of it? Exactly. Those are just labels. Labels. For example, before I met you, I never would have dreamed Uncle Stephen had a sweet side. You know, people don't understand him like I do. It takes persistence to get past his defenses. Exactly. Aren't you gonna get that? What if it's someone important? Everyone who's important to talk to today is in this house. Now let me see what I can do to help you understand the Braden clan. I want to know everything. Well. Wow. <laughs> Good job. Jillian doesn't understand all of this, doesn't understand big families. And Haley says, uh, what do you need to understand? I'll help you with that. Isn't there a lot we need to understand about people and about family dynamics? And when we understand it, what a world of difference it really makes. You know, we've assumed for years and I, and I say we, I'm talking about for generations, probably hundreds or thousands of years, that wisdom and understanding come from age and experience. But the book of Job teaches us that may not be the case. Listen to what Elihu said in Job. You don't need to turn there, I'll just read it to you. Just listen to these words. So Elihu spoke out and said, I am young in years and you are old. Therefore, I was shy and afraid to tell you what I think. I thought age should speak. An increased years should teach wisdom. But it is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty gives them understanding. The abundant in years may not be wise. And I'm not looking at anybody in particular when I look up. Nor may elders understand justice. 
you know what? There's a much greater source of wisdom and understanding than age and experience. There are people that are old. There are people who have been through a lot. But by the standards of this book, they're not wise. And they really don't understand. I think it was uh, Charles Swindoll that once said uh, somebody was upset because they were interviewed for a position and they had 20 years of experience and the other person only had five years and they hired the person with the five years. They went in and talked and they were upset and they said, well, the reason is that person has had five years of experience. You've had the same one year of experience 20 times. You catch that? <laughs> Some of us don't learn from experience. Some of us keep on going into the same mistakes over and over and over again because we don't learn from our experiences. And age is no guarantee that we're going to be wise and have understanding. There's a source that's much better and much more reliable than age and experience, and that's the Word of God. I want to just give you a couple of verses from Psalms. I understand more than the age because I have observed your precepts. <laughs> Understanding this word and obeying it causes you to have more understanding than those who are old. So you need to be encouraged this morning if you're here and you're young, understanding and wisdom is not just reserved for the old and the experienced. The young can have that as well, as Elihu showed for us in Job. The unfolding of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. Again, as these words are unfolded in front of us, gives light and understanding. And then finally, one on a verse. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter 2 with me real quick. If you wonder where Proverbs is, basically if you open the Bible in the middle, you'll probably come to Psalms. Proverbs is the next book after that. Pretty close to the center of the Bible, Proverbs chapter 2. We're going to learn in Proverbs chapter 2 that understanding and wisdom is a great protection for relationships. It's a great protection. It's, it's a skill that we want to have in relationships that we should desperately long for is understanding. Proverbs chapter 2, it starts off the chapter talking about crying out with all of your heart and searching after wisdom and understanding is, is like a treasure. And then it finally says this in verse 10. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will guard you. Understanding will watch over you. So what we're talking about this morning, understanding, the promise when you get it is it's going to watch over you. And it's going to watch over you to deliver you from some things, to deliver you, first of all, in verse 12, the way of evil. From the man who speaks perverse things. From those who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who delight in doing evil and rejoice in the perversity of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their way. So the first thing, understanding is going to watch over us, to deliver us from a person who will be a negative influence upon our life. But second of all, if you have understanding, wisdom is going to deliver you from sexual sin and perversity. It says in verse 16, to deliver you from, here's the second one, it delivers you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters with her words. How many people have been taken in by somebody's words, either a man or woman, sexually? And they believe those words and they bit the bait because <laughs> they didn't have understanding. They didn't have God's wisdom at the core of their heart. that leaves the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death and her tracks lead to death. None who go to her return again, nor do they reach the path of life. So, 
Here's on the positive side. Understanding wisdom is going to deliver us from those who have a negative, evil influence upon us is going to deliver us from sexual sin. But then in verse 20, this is what it's going to do. So you will walk in the way of good men and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be up rooted from it understanding is crucial crucial (laughs) brothers and sisters friends it's crucial to having healthy thriving relationships so what I want to do this morning is basically give you an introductory course into three different relationships that we all find ourselves in And just give us a little bit of understanding. And, you know, to be honest with you, I can't give you any understanding, nor can my sermon. Only God can give that to you through his word as he opens those up. So let me start with prayer. Because, like I said last week, even as Jesus taught on the road to Emmaus, opening up the Old Testament, teaching about himself, here's the anointed Jesus. And it says they didn't understand until God opened their minds to understand. Hearing words reading books, listening to sermons, doesn't equal understanding. Information, knowledge is not understanding. Understanding is something that God gives a person in the core of their being deep down in their heart that all of a sudden they say, I get it. I got it. So let me pray. Father, I come before you now because... I want to confess, God, I can't give anybody understanding this morning. That only comes from your word and by the breath of the Almighty, (laughs) breathing it into the innermost part of a person's being. So God, I ask this morning that as these words are opened up this morning, would you unfold the light and the understanding that come from them I ask you that your Holy Spirit would open our minds to understand, Lord. It would be more than more information and words about relationships. God, I pray that the Spirit of God would give us the ability in our hearts to really get it this morning. Father, I I boast about my weakness and my inability to accomplish that. And I lean solely and totally upon you your spirit, and your word to do things here today that only God can do that can be way different from just listening to a sermon to experiencing the transforming word of God that can change us forever. God, that's what we long for this morning and ask you to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5.17. The first relationship I want to talk about is the relationship between a believer and a non-believer, between a person who's saved and a person that is lost. There's something we need to understand about that relationship in order to be wise and to protect ourselves from trouble that we can get into. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, it's every person who has come to that place to recognize that their sin separated them from a holy God and they grabbed onto what Jesus did for them on the cross by faith. That's the person it's talking about. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anybody is trusting Jesus for their salvation and him and him alone, according to the Bible, you're in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. If you're a believer in Jesus, you need to know you're not who you were before you trusted Jesus. At the core of your being, you are somebody brand new from who you were. You're a brand new creation. Now, 
The implication here is very simple. Those who have not trusted in Jesus are not a brand new creation at the core of their being. They're still that old person. And everything the Bible says about a person who doesn't know Jesus is still true of them. So the first thing we need to realize is that we are very, very different than a person who doesn't know Jesus. At the core of our being, we are brand new creations. And that's the work of God in our life. For instance, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, talks about the response of those who don't know Jesus to the word of God and to the things of God. You and I, we value, we love, we appreciate the word of God and the things of God. But listen to what the scripture says about the man who doesn't know Christ. But the natural man does not accept the things of the spirit for their foolishness to him. And he cannot, it doesn't say he may not or chooses not, it says he cannot. He does not even have the ability to get them because they're spiritually appraised. <laughs> you know what that means? If somebody here today that doesn't know Jesus, unless the Spirit of God is working in their heart this morning and drawing them to Christ, the natural man's going to say, Pat, what you're saying today is foolishness. <laughs> you're nuts. This guy is nuts up there today, what he's saying. And they're, they're going to be thinking in their mind, I, I just, I don't buy any of this stuff. They're going to reject it. They don't even have the ability to get and understand what, what's being said. And they reject these things. They make no sense to them. They just don't get it. Turn in your Bibles. You're in 2 Corinthians 5. Just turn over to the next chapter, chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians And now God gives a special instruction to believers. Do not be bound together or unequally yoked with a non-believer. Don't be in a committed relationship. Don't be in a relationship where you come in and you both commit yourself as partners together, a believer and a non-believer at an equal level. Listen to what it says. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with, basically this is speaking about the, the devil. Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. You know, he's asking this person, what, what, what partnership? <laughs> what fellowship? What do you have in one in accord and agreement with? What, what portion do you have? Uh, you know, what, what's in common here? with those who don't have Christ living in them. He's saying at the core of the being, we are as different as righteousness is from lawlessness, as light is from darkness, as different as Christ is of the devil, as different as a believer is with an unbeliever, as different as someone in whom the living God dwells, in a place of idol worship. That's how different we are from those who don't know Jesus. And so I think of two major applications as I think about this. And the first one is this, and I want you to hear me real clear. Especially if you're still single and dating, sort of say, if you're in that place, whether uh, divorced and dating, uh, looking to remarry or single, never married before, whatever. When the scripture tells you not to be in a committed relationship with a non-believer, 
It's not just a command. It's wisdom. You hear that? This is wise because we have nothing in common. That's the reason he gives the command. Not because I'm God and you're man and I can tell you whatever I want and you got to do it. It isn't then don't be unequally yoked with a non-believer. It's be, he's saying because the wisdom is the fact at the core of your being, you need to understand there is nothing that you have in common with this person. Now I'll admit this. On the outside, there may be a lot that looks the same. <laughs> they may be a religious person. They may be a church-going person. They may be a moral person. They may do a lot of good deeds and give to different community projects and things like that. And so all the external dress say, well, you know, they're a good person. There's a big difference between a good person that doesn't know Jesus and a person in whom Jesus lives. At the core of our being, we're different. And God is trying to warn you, and I'm trying to warn you today as your pastor. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, don't play the game with non-believers. Because at the core of your being, you're totally different. And, I, and you know, I, I can tell you not only by the word of God, I can tell you on the basis of the testimony of people that I've known that have come through this body who have said, you know what, Pat? I married a person that's not a believer. And I love them. And they're a good person. But the reality is, when it comes to the most important things in life, to me, and the things that excite me the most, we just don't connect. We're not able to share on those. There's a hole in their relationship. Brothers and sisters, please listen to me today. <laughs> don't go there. They could be a good person. They could be a loving person. But the reality is, it's at the core of your being, you're different. And if you move into that relationship, you're going to find in time something's going to be missing because the greatest, most important, exciting things to your life are not going to be shared together in common. We're different at the core. And the other thing I think that application that jumps out to me when I think about this is we as believers should not be shocked when non-believers act like non-believers. <laughs> I mean, how many times we look at politicians, and some of them, thank God, are believers. Uh, but, you know, uh, you know, we look at people, and they make decisions that are different than our values, and they do things that are different than we think. Hey, the reality is this. These people don't know Jesus. They don't operate out of the same value system. They don't think the same way we do because we have the Spirit of God living in us who's working in us constantly sanctifying and fine-tuning and cleansing and our, our values and our thinking and our actions. So don't be shocked by it. Instead, pray for them. <laughs> Instead, uh, you know, minister to them. Uh, and I'm not just talking about politicians now because they're saved politicians, unsaved. We got saved and unsaved friends. We got the list goes on and on. The point is this, when we interact with non-believers, we're going to protect ourselves and act while we recognize we really are different, even though everything on the outside looks the same. And there's wisdom to be able to walk accordingly. Let me talk about a second relationship that we encounter, especially every Sunday as you come to church at Moraine Valley Church. And that's not just the relationship of the believer and the lost. Now I'm going to talk about the relationship of the Christian with another Christian. Did you know there's three different kinds of Christians? Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. As I read this passage, I want you to see if you can pick up the three different kinds of believers and what characterizes them. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 starts like this. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, 
as to infants in Christ. Let me underline, and I, brethren, speaking to believers here, and he calls them men of flesh, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you're not yet able for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? Three kinds of people. Spiritual man, babes in Christ, fleshly or carnal. Christian, believer, man. The spiritual man simply is this. He's characterized as being controlled by the Spirit of God. That's that, that the Spirit of God doesn't just reside in him because the Spirit of God resides in every believer. But according to the spiritual man, when you read the scripture, the spiritual man is not just one who the Spirit resides in, but is the one whom the Spirit presides over their life. <laughs> and the Spirit is now empowering them and controlling and influencing their life just like wine influences the behavior and the decisions and the thinking and the attitudes of a person who's under the influence of alcohol in the same way the Holy Spirit influences the decisions and the thinking and the behavior and the actions of a person who's being controlled by the Spirit. And they're able to understand this book, the spiritual man. You know why? Because the Spirit of God is controlling and empowering them, when they come to this book, they got the Spirit of God to teach them and help them understand and get it. I read something recently, I love it, said this, to read the Word of God without depending on the Holy Spirit of God is like trying to read a sundial without the sun. Think about that. <laughs> Ever look at a sundial when the sun is out? Doesn't work, does it? And a lot of us are trying to read God's word without depending on the spirit of God. And we just don't get it. And, and it doesn't make sense. But when we take this book, the spiritual man, because he reads it in dependence upon the Holy Spirit as he controls him, he's able to understand these things. So, so that's the spiritual man. The second person this passage talks about is the babe in Christ, the infant in Christ. Now again, the, the infant in Christ has the Spirit of God living in him. And the Spirit of God is starting to work in him and to break down the controls of all the things of the flesh so that the Spirit can take complete control of their life. But at this time, the babe in Christ is only able to receive milk just like a newborn baby in the world. And that's not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, hear me. For a babe only to be able to handle milk is not a bad thing. It's a normal thing. And for a new believer in Christ who only can handle milk, that's not a bad thing. That's a normal thing. And it's something we should be aware of as we minister to one another. Look at verse 2 again. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. That's what is true of a baby. You give them milk and not solid food because they're not ready to receive it. But then there's the third person, and that is the men of flesh, carnal. And he says this, I gave you milk to drink and not solid food for you are not yet able to receive it. That's a bad thing. <laughs> you following me? Because a carnal Christian is not a babe. He's not just, I'm a new believer in Christ, and I just don't get this, and all I can handle is milk right now. It's a person by this time who may have been saved 20 years, and by this time should be leading a small group, and by this time should be discipling and mentoring other people. It's by this time he should be a teacher, and yet they still need somebody else to show them the ABCs of the Bible. They're no different than a baby. They're just like a baby. They just don't get it. All they can handle is milk. And for 20 years, they stayed at the same place, even though they've known Jesus. And then worse than that, the carnal person, look at verse 3. 
for you are still fleshly. He says, even now you're not able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? You know what he's saying here? Your life as a carnal Christian is no different than anybody in the world's. <laughs> you're walking just like a person that doesn't know Jesus. Matter of fact, if you're in a crowd of unbelievers and people are looking to say, who's the believer here? They couldn't pick you out of the crowd because there's nothing different about your life. When they look at your Facebook page, when they listen to your conversations, when they look at your conduct, they say, this person, I, I really can't tell. There's nothing different in their life from the life of the person who doesn't know Jesus. That's the carnal believer. That's not a good thing. I said, for a babe, that's good. That's normal. A person that's known Jesus for 20 years, not good. Not good. That's the carnal Christian. You know what? I think that a lot of us have missed and never realized that the, mature, the measure of maturity is not how many Christian activities you go to, not even how much knowledge you have of the Bible, but the measure of Christian maturity is, is the Holy Spirit in control of your life, and are you obeying the Bible? <laughs> the person who had an understanding more than the agent was the person who obeyed the precepts of God, not just the person that knew them. And I think a lot of us as Christians have kind of lulled ourselves into thinking we're good and we're mature because we know a lot of the Bible. And people at Moraine know a lot of the Bible. Those who have been here a long time under Pastor Bill and myself and the others have taught here. We know a lot of the Bible. That is not maturity. Maturity is putting into practice what we know of the Bible empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. That's maturity. And that's the difference between those who are immature carnal Christians and those that are not. So as you walk this morning in the back, as we sit together, as you walk out to the parking lot, as we go get coffee, you need to realize there's four different kinds of people among us this morning. And we'll be wise to understand that and recognize that each person needs something different. You see, when you understand these things, you understand this person needs something different than that person. In fact, I was meeting with a person this week, and, and I really was. I, I was. As I was listening and asking, and I probably listened for two hours, and my question, I kept on saying, to God, does this person need to be encouraged or spanked? I mean that. I didn't know what they needed. They are a believer that's walked with Jesus for a long time and mature, and they got themselves caught in some very serious sin. And I had to hear and say, God, what's going on here? Do, do they need encouragement or a spanking? You know what, guys? Sometimes the most loving thing we can do is give a brother or sister a spanking. I'm not encouraging us all to go out and spank one another this morning. <laughs> That's something you do after two hours of listening, depending on the spirit, to say, God, is this really what they need? Because when I found out this brother needed encouragement and not a spanking, even though he's caught in very serious sin. And so we really need to hear. So as we walk out today, recognize there's going to be people here that the core of their being, they are totally different than us, even though they look just like us. Then there's other people that are brand new believers in Christ. They're just babes. There's others that are spiritual men and women that, that God's Spirit is controlling them and they get the things of God and they love the things of God. And then there's going to be the carnal Christian who's a person whose life is no different than anybody's in the world, and they, once they get out of this building, man, until next Sunday, you'd have no idea that they knew Jesus because their life is no different. That's the four different kinds of people we have right here. We're sitting among each other this morning. We're wise to understand that. We're wise to recognize each person needs something different and to live in light of it. I want to talk about one more relationship. If I stopped here, I probably wouldn't get in any trouble at all today. You'd probably say, okay, Pat, that was a little bit rough, but I'm going to talk about men and women. You ever meet a man or a woman? <laughs> we deal with each other every day. And I'm not just talking about the married. I'm not just talking about the dating. 
If you're alive and you live in this world, you deal with people of the opposite sex all the time. And we have a lot to learn about each other. Matter of fact, do you know what the thinnest book in the world is? Look at this. What's the thinnest book of the world? What men know about women. <laughs> thinnest book of the Bible. Once you know it, forgive me, Chelsea, Sharissa, Courtney, Kimberly. I live all with women. And I know about that much, guys, not, not too much. So what I did this week to get ready for this Sunday is I read two different books on this topic so I get everything I could to understand about men and women before we went. The first one was Everything Men Know About Women. You see that one? <laughs> now you need to know, the print in this book is unbelievably small. <laughs> this took a little while to read. But uh, this is something that I, I wanted to make sure. Then there's another book about, that was written about understanding women. And as you know, I'm a speed reader, and so I got through that one before this morning. Just something a little light before you guys all want to kill me. But one of the key tendencies, there's a key tendency within man and woman. And there's a lot of things we could talk about and a lot of value. Maybe we get to the marriage side, we'll talk some of this, I don't know. There are some key differences between us that the better we understand that, as the scripture says, men dwell with your uh, wives according to understanding. It doesn't mean try to understand them totally, but what you do understand, live in light of and according to. And, and, and there's some great values in understanding our differences. But there's a key tendency within man and one that's within women that is often misunderstood and the cause of much conflict that we have with one another. I have seen this often in both men and women, and we learn both of them in the fall. Turn to Genesis chapter 3, very first book of the Bible. Now, as you're turning to Genesis 3, first book of the Bible, you remember what happened. God gave Adam a command. He said, Adam, uh, in the garden, eat freely of all the trees that I've provided for you. Enjoy all these great gifts that I've given to you. But there's one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that I don't want you to eat from. Because if you eat from that tree in that day, you're surely going to die. Well, you know the story goes on. In chapter 3, Satan came to the woman, Eve, not the one who received the command. Man, man received the command. And uh, Satan came to Eve and began to engage her in spiritual warfare and to try to get her to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you know where, anybody know where Adam was when that was going on? He was right there with her. Look at verse 6 in chapter 3. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and there was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Can you believe that, guys? Speak to the guys now. Satan is engaging your wife in spiritual warfare, and you never stand up to protect her. You don't even say a word. You sit back passively and quietly. And you know something? That's a tendency that men have. Passivity. And I've seen a lot of marriages and a lot of wives have been dri driven crazy because of the passivity of their men. You know, we talk about the black community and the, the problem that's there because of the absence of the male figure in the family to be a husband to the wife and a father to the children. I want to propose this morning, I think there's just a serious of a problem in the white community and in the white churches. Because while the men are not absent, they're passive. <laughs> what good does a passive guy do? 
When life's problems are facing you, when Satan's attacking the family, when things go on and there's the guy sitting back passively and quietly letting it all fall on his wife or letting it all fall on the woman. Guys, we have a problem just as much in the white community, a different kind of problem. They're both very serious problems. But a lot of hurt and damage and suffering has come to women, to families, and to churches because men have sit back passively and quietly and let it fall on the women. Let it fall on the women. That's a tendency we have, guys, that's not good. But there's one also for the woman. We read about it in verse 16. It comes under the curse. Chapter 3, it says this. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. Yet your desire, underline that word, your desire will be for your husband. Yet he will rule over you. Now that word desire has two possible meanings. It's only used three times in the entire Bible. That, that particular Hebrew word for desire is only used three times in the entire Bible. One time right here, another time in the book of the Song of Solomon written by a different author centuries later, written by Solomon, and it's talking about sexual desire. The other use of this word happens to be used by the same author 15 verses later. <laughs> Talking about the desire to control. And so when you take it in context, anybody that's, that understands anything about interpreting the scripture says, I can't take something that's written by another author centuries later and try to pull that in and yank that in here when what's written by the same author 15 verses later using the same word indicates to us how that author used the word. And the curse upon the woman is that her desire would be to control and master her husband. The desire to control. Ever meet a controlling woman before? And I, I'm not saying this to be funny. I, I'm really not. I'm not trying to, to play on, on that. But the fact is, is that there's a tendency within women to control. And can you imagine? I, I laugh because I, I, this, I don't laugh because I know one, one uh, brother tells me, you know, that, that they call his, his wife the director, <laughs> you know, because she handles all the details and she constantly, it doesn't matter what situation you're in. I mean, she's got everything figured out and everybody what to do. And when you get into a relationship with a controlling woman and a passive man, it doesn't take much imagination to see what's going to happen in that relationship, how things will be upside down and how much frustration comes into a relationship where a man who God has ordained to lead becomes passive and the woman who was ordained to submit to the man becomes controlling and rises up to take lead in the relationship. This is a tendency. This is a struggle that we have. And I'm speaking specifically now to married couples in that it's so interesting in the New Testament that God gives the command to men to lead, the ones who have the tendency to be passive, and the command to women to submit, the one that has the tendency to be controlling. The good news is this, in that same context, is the Holy Spirit is given to us to break the control, to, to break down the the passivity, to break down the controlling nature and to empower women to live as submissive, not trying to control every situation and every person they run into, and for men not to sit back passively and quietly with everything that comes and just let it fall upon somebody else to take the leadership. See, that's a tendency we have. And the better we understand it, 
I'll tell you one thing, I think the more grace we may give one another <laughs> as we see those things being displayed, but hopefully as each one of us listens to our own struggle, we need to be at the feet of Jesus, saying, Lord, I need your spirit to break that in my life, to empower me by your Holy Spirit to do new and fresh things in my life. We desperately need understanding in our relationships. There, guys, I just gave you an introductory course. These words unfold understanding. And we need to be very clear on where understanding comes from. Just let me give you a couple verses. Look at this in closing. With him are wisdom and might. To him belong counsel and understanding. Next verse. But it is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty. That means the spirit of God, the spirit of Almighty gives them understanding. I think I have one more verse. Who has put wisdom in the innermost being or given understanding to the mind? Guys, the point is God gives understanding. And as we read this book, dependent upon God... So that as we read this sundial, God is giving us the light we need to see and his spirit is breathing into our innermost being understanding as I look at this book. Guys, we need understanding to protect us in our relationships and to give us wisdom on how to operate. And I said we need to be at the feet of Jesus. Look at this next verse. The New Testament tells us Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we need to be humbly, as Proverbs 2 says, daily at the gates of this book. Seeking to understand knowledge of the Holy One, of Jesus is understanding according to Proverbs 9.10. And we need to be in this book, depending upon the Spirit of Christ who lives in me, to give me understanding in every situation, every person, every relationship I encounter in life. Let me pray, Chad. Would you guys come on up and close us? Father, I've shared my heart. And I just pray, God, because as I said, I, I brought your word. I shared my heart. God, I pray, first of all, that your word would carry more weight than Pat's heart. Uh, Lord, would you today, I pray, that your spirit would give us the sunlight that we need as we hear and meditate on these words. God, would you be pleased to confront us where we've not lived wisely with this understanding? God, would you be pleased to confront us in places in our life where if there's a person here who's living as a carnal Christian, I pray, God, that you would fall heavy upon their heart today, that their life would be different than the rest of the world. God, I pray for us as men and women, we would deal with our controlling natures and our passive natures. God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would let this be more than just a sermon, but God, would, this, would you light within us a fire to get understanding and to come to your book on our knees, crying out to Jesus in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's in his name I pray. Amen.